Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carter Monier, um, and welcome to, I guess, the first panel of SPX 2019. This one is about, let me check the slide, queer <laughs> sci-fi and world building. Um, I am joined by four superstars in uh, that discipline, discipline. <laughs> and uh, what I'm going to do games. is just go down the table, um, and I would ask that each of you shares your name and pronouns, please. Um, I'm Hannah Templer, and my pronouns are she, they. I'm Rosemary Valero O'Connell, and my pronouns are she, they. Oh, wow, it's going to go all the way down. I'm Allison Wilgus, and my pronouns are also she, they. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shingyun Kaur, and my pronouns are they, them. <laughs> Perfect. I took notes. And <laughs> my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a transsexual woman. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at some point, uh, we're going to have slides that like just rotate through with examples of everyone's work. I assume that if you're at this panel, you at least have a passing familiarity with everybody here, I would hope. Um, <laughs> I, I hope. Um, so. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, like ask a question and then let you talk it out amongst yourselves. Like I don't have like super structured anything. I did not bring notes. Um, so I guess what I want to open with is if we're talking about queer sci-fi and we're talking about the concept of like building a world in which like queer people can live and thrive and be represented. Um, what does like a queer science fiction world um, have that sets it apart from like the more typical like traditional science fiction universes like Star Trek or that's the only sci-fi I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to give you guys a second to think about this. Um, I feel like, the, I was thinking about this this morning, and I, I feel like as a queer person when I'm making a science fiction world, a lot of what distinguishes my stuff from other people's stuff is like what kind of danger I'm interested in and what kind of trauma I'm interested in and what, what I want the safe things to be and what I want mm -hmm. the, the tension to be. And because uh, most science fiction stories are adventure stories, uh -huh. uh, most adventure stories are based on something terrible as possible going to happen to somebody. Most of those kind of second act lows have to do with something terrible happening to the protagonist specifically, which is usually personal. And I feel like the queerness isn't just informing like who is kissing who, but also like what kind of trauma do I want to put this character through that I think is either upsetting in a fun cathartic way or is just uh, only interesting and exciting to me and not upsetting at all. And I feel like that's kind of a lot of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, for me, a lot of my stories are essentially things where lots of bad things happen to people, but not because they are queer. Uh, mm -hmm. Because of many other reasons, like likely because they are depressed and have anxiety. But uh, queerness is just um, not one of the primary uh, factors for either violence or trauma. I mean, for me, sort of the appeal of sci-fi is that it gives you this chance to sort of examine potential and imagine futures, sort of not only when it comes to technological advances, which I find I'm a lot less interested when I'm dealing with sci-fi, but sort of like potential futures in terms of social dynamics, in terms of shifts or changes or upheavals of hegemony. And so what is kind of lovely about sci-fi is you get to present this world and the rules are completely up to you. You get to sort of imbue it with, um, in my case, just you know, sort of whatever queerness is to me, it gets to sort of be marinating in it and no one gets to, I, I feel like when readers are approaching a sci-fi story, there's a certain level of like, they just accept that whatever rules you're laying down and whatever world you've presented, like those are the rules and they're gonna kind of like follow suit with, with, with whatever you're kind like of. Like you're drawing the shape of what's normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah like yeah, yeah. here's and the then, normal stuff for these people right. and here's the weird thing that's mm -hmm. just happened. Right, and you get to be the arbiter yeah. of that. And in Star Trek, the weird thing might be, you're kissing a man and you were also <laughs> a man? <laughs> you used to be a woman and now you're a dude? That's crazy. And like, whereas in my story, that would not be what's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, for me, a lot of that also tracks with me. Um, I think one thing that comes up a lot is in my work is worlds colliding and how um, kind of in sci-fi there's like a, a lot of an established genre where 
um, especially a lot of like grimy sci-fi, I don't know what else to call it. Um, and it's kind of like, how do queer people fit into what is already established um, as a genre and like how do you navigate that as sort of, it feels like an outsider a little bit. Um, and a lot of what comes up in my work is a dissonance of worlds colliding. So like if there is really advanced technology, like who gets access to that? what is advanced and what remains, and figuring out like how queer people fit into that, which feels relevant to kind of like the real world too. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of how I work with it. So I know that there are like pretty different approaches to writing sci-fi. Some people treat it very much as like a direct analog for like our lives as oppressed people under capitalism, and other people imagine like a more utopian future. Mm -hmm. When you are approaching like building your sci-fi universes with the idea of like representing queer people, how do you go about that? Like, do you feel yourself thinking like, well, even in this like techno future where the motorcycles fly? people still hate fags? Or is it like you um, have a techno future where the motorcycles fly and everyone is gay and that's very <laughs> cool and like <laughs> hardly remarked on? Um, well, I can jump into that. Yeah. Please. Um, yeah, I, I don't want the tension in my stories to kind of come from the pain of being queer necessarily. Like, um, it's hard for me to... Can I move the microphone closer to you? Oh, sure, sorry. <laughs> Uh, what I was saying is I don't want the source of tension and the source of distress or like the main oh. conflict to be um, centered around the fact that the characters are queer. But that being said, thinking about, you know, um, compulsive heterosexuality mm -hmm. and like how those themes feed into my story is really important to me. And um, one thing that comes up a lot in my book, uh, Cosmonites, is kind of how uh, people have structured a patriarchal society without really thinking about it, and it's not so much cruel as it is leaving out people, and how do the outsiders kind of navigate that system and make it work for them um, without necessarily suffering every day of their lives, but like how is it working for them, and how have they just learn to exist in that structure? Hmm. I find that, I mean, both in my work and because it's kind of how I want my life to be, uh, queerness is sort of normalized, ubiquitous, it's just like, it is assumed that every character on the page is queer. It's just the world as it exists is primarily uh, queer because that's uh, in part what my experience of going through the world has been, but partially also because that is, I find it sort of more, I find the utopian sort of um, vision more cathartic than the one where I am still sort of even in my fiction having to reckon with, uh, you know, the certain experiences that exist in our world. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I, I think that sci-fi as a genre is so exciting when it's in the hands of queer people or, or other marginalized folks. Um, I mean, anyone that isn't, you know, a cis straight white man because we have such a sort of a greater stake, I feel like, in being able to imagine a future that differs from our present, like our, our investment and kind of like being able to create worlds that treat us differently is heightened and I think often has much more, those stories just end up having more subtlety and more, I don't know, nuance. Um, I don't know, I, yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, personally, I feel like most fiction is in some way us processing our trauma in our lives and whatever it is we're going through, like it's therapy, that's why we spend so much time on it. <laughs> um, and I, and I, I think it's incredibly personal what therapy is useful to you and I, in your actual therapy, and I think that's also true in fiction. Yeah. So I never want to criticize other queer people for making a future in which queer people are still suffering for their queerness. Yeah. If it's like, this is the kind of world that I'm interested in exploring, and this is the kind of thing that I really need to explore yeah. right now. Okay. Uh, and often those stories are, of course, the ones that I would actually want to read if I was going to read a sad story about mm -hmm. somebody being gay, because, like, well, at least you have some experience with your gay sadness <laughs> that you're that you're processing through yeah. this. You're not just doing like right. this seems like a fun thing to torture somebody <laughs> with. Um, but that said, like personally, I, I feel like I really like to put my characters to the ringer. Mm -hmm but I don't find that specific ringer to be an interesting one. And often they do have things in their lives that are intersecting with their queerness that might be difficult. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they're having trouble figuring out their gender shit or maybe they dated a dude and maybe they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have dated that guy. Maybe I shouldn't be dating guys. Mm -hmm. Like, cause I, I don't think that 
uh, a future in which there's no homophobia will completely get rid of that. I think that probably humans will always have evolving understandings of themselves, and like that's fine. But there's a huge difference between that and oh, I married a dude and stayed married to him for 30 years because my uh, mom told me the worst thing I could be is a lesbian. Like, that's a very right. different yeah. type of thing, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of my work is very, like, man against faceless corporations. <laughs> um, but I actually think that I thought a lot more about queerness in my work before I actually came out as queer. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a pretty, like, late-in-life queer. Um, and I know we're like, yeah. <laughs> um, but as a result, like when I started my webcomic, which was like a good, you know, five years ago, the protagonists were always women having feelings for each other. Um, but they're also like little jelly bean people because I didn't know how to draw people five years ago. <laughs> um, so they're all in like little spacesuits with helmets. So you can't really tell gender or anything really from other than dialogue. Um, and as I kind of got more queer, I guess, uh, or became a little more accepting of the fact that I was queer, and continued writing this thing, I would look back at stuff and just kind of be like, no, that character is queer too. <laughs> no, really, they all are. Um, so in a sense, like my writing is just kind of a fantasy where like no one's not queer, um, and I really don't care if it's realistic or not. Um, like, you know, I've got stupid queers, I've got, yeah. I've got dumb queers, I've got, like, evil queers. Um, the whole representation yeah, is yeah, yeah, I feel like queer idiots have a, have a deserve to exist as well, and, um, and uh, yeah, that I, I, I put myself in my work. I'd love to hear if, if this is true of the two of you, too, because I, I have some of, just to build on what Shing was just saying, like, I, the book that I just finished releasing, like, literally on Tuesday. Oh, you've uh, been at it for, like, ten years. Yeah, I've been at it for like I've been at it since I was a much younger person who was very convinced that I was straight, which is. Um, <laughs> but it meant that like it wasn't actually until the editorial process mm -hmm. for this book, which was only a few years ago, my editor is like, I just think it's so nice that everybody in this book is bi, and I was like, they're, oh, <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah, I did literally write that all of these people kiss people of multiple genders. I just had never, for some reason, put these Lego pieces together. So I'm curious if you've had that experience of like making something that you don't actually understand the ways in which it's queer until later. You're like, oh boy. Yes, absolutely. I, I feel like you always, I don't know, learn a lot about your own work through what other people are picking up on and what they're responding to. And I like sometimes when I set out to write a saying, I'm, it's sort of like, thesis driven, like I am examining this aspect of my life, I'm compartmentalizing it in this way, and sometimes I don't know what I was doing until someone else is like, hey, is, is this one about like you processing this type of trauma? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess. No, it's a therapy. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I actually wrote Cosmonites when I was married to a man two years ago, and I came out as a lesbian, and like my whole life changed. Um, but I processed the book after that, obviously, as I was kind of drawing it and realizing in retrospect, like, I wrote this whole book subconsciously, like, this is about me and this is about compulsive heterosexuality and, like, figuring out how to, again, like, navigate a world where you don't necessarily fit and having your worlds collide in that way, which is why it's, like, medieval stuff and in space. Like, <laughs> oh, this doesn't fit. Like, how do you navigate that? Um, so, yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I guess taking a step away from the question of queerness for a mm -hmm. second and focusing more on the world building, mm -hmm. I think um, like among our panelists, we have like a pretty varied uh, approach in the way that you build science fiction worlds. Like Rosemary, yours are very like, it seems like you have charts written <laughs> out of like, you know, you know, you understand how the public transit system works in your world. <laughs> and then, like, if I'm doing sci-fi and I know, like, um, if I look at uh, other sci-fi, like, it's more like the suggestion of things, mm -hmm. like an assertion that, like, as uh, Shang said, like, drawing the shape of what's normal, mm -hmm. like, um, it's sort of an assertion, like, yeah, this does work, you mm -hmm. know, like, and there's some sci-fi reason for it, and I'm not really, <laughs> really that worried about it. Um, to what extent do each of you think about like the internal consistency and like the history and whatever of the worlds that you're building? It's so, a, oh, go for it. No, no, go for it. Very little. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for, for context, uh, I'm also an installation artist and that's where a lot of like my world building roots come from. Um, and the way 
There you go. <laughs> so the it. way I, I do a lot of my installation work is I built the outlines of the world we exist in, and then I invite all my crew members and uh, visitors to collaborate with me. So we'll have things like a bank of lockers, and people that come in to work on my crew, I'd be like, OK, now pretend you're basically LARPing the character. Um, and fill your locker with the things your character would own. Um, and that way, we kind of end up building like a very built out like universe together. Um, and because of that, I've become really good at letting go of things. <laughs> um, and for my webcomic, it was initially incredibly like aesthetic driven. Just like I like drawing weird, like slimy monsters, but I also want to write about queer feelings. So. It was kind of like, I'm just going to mush these together. And I didn't think about them that much. It was like, I'm going to have two people having queer feelings standing in front of a bank of slimy monsters. <laughs> cool, I got it. I'm a sci-fi writer. Um, so since then, I've started thinking about it a lot more. And now I think about city infrastructure. But um, when I started, there was not an awful lot of that. And I feel OK about it. <laughs> so um, just. I think about it a lot, but I think it depends a lot on the particular thing I'm working on and what my goals for that piece are. So one of these is a prose piece, but I, I recently had a short story come out that's about Catherine Wright using time travel to try to save her brothers. And it's a very like magical realism type story, so it was important to me that her experience was consistent and I had a really good model in my head of like what is it like for her to go through this and what does it feel like, like in her body. Mm -hmm. That was important. But the actual mechanics of how she's time traveling, like completely unimportant. Like as long as, <laughs> as long as it's internally consistent and it made sense for her, that was fine. Yeah. My other, my more recent book, which is like a comic, it's just time travel in a science fiction setting, more explicitly science fiction. Um, I always say that time travel is ex inevitably bullshit, and it's just a matter of figuring out which part you want people to be paying attention to, and have that part pay it make sense and then wave desperately people away from the part <laughs> that is broken and just like basically reader like focusing reader attention which a lot of writing is about and i and i think that that kind of dichotomy is basically at the root of all my world building which is like figure out what's important to make sense make sure that makes sense as much as possible direct the reader's attention toward the parts that are consistent and that are important and make sure that i'm not distracting them with parts of the world that even if they're interesting are either distracting from the story or break some other part of it, no matter how cool or, or interesting I think it is. It's like I don't want them to ask the wrong questions sure. about my world. Mm -hmm. And the more ridiculous the thing that's happening, the more that's true. And mm -hmm. it doesn't get much more ridiculous than time travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I mean, uh, for what is left, because it is such a short story, it's only 30 pages. Um, I knew that I had sort of like a limited amount of space to imply the existence of a much larger world. And I wanted it to feel like it was sort of a, a capsule within a universe. Like I, I wanted, um, even if you're not going to see, like you're, you're only seeing this kind of little bit, but I want you to feel like it is part of a larger picture. Um, so I had to sort of decide what, uh, what felt important, like what would sort of serve me, what pieces of information would kind of build some flesh on the bones of what I had. Um, but, but kind of the nice thing about it being such a short story is there's like very little opportunity for me to contradict myself. Like I can just kind of like put this thing in here, puts this thing in here, and it's never gonna come up again and no one's ever gonna be able to fact check me. Um, <laughs> but also I, you know, I'm like, I'm not particularly interested in sort of the mechanics of hard sci-fi. Like I don't, you know, like the central sort of like thing in what is left is this like uh, this ship's engine is like powered by memories which is very like you know poetic bullshit and like has no <laughs> grounding or basis in any actual science because I wasn't interested in that like it's a story about emotions and interiority and like all this stuff so I yeah like you pick and choose kind of what needs to be explained for the story to function the way you want it to function and the rest of it I think the like, big mistake people make early on is to over explain things that you yeah, don't yeah. actually need to yeah, explain yeah, absolutely. and that's like what bad writers group gives you notes on it's like no 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 it's fine just yeah, leave it alone need to, like you don't need to know yeah. Yeah. you don't need to know it's yeah. fine mm -hmm. yeah um, my philosophy on this is to write like an extensive bible of all the like facts of everything and then just never share <laughs> 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 so like my running joke with Cosmo it's funny because no one ever asks, like, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. have to explain it because no one really cares. Mm -hmm. um, but the stuff that I do end up touching on is the stuff where, you know, you write this world and you write how characters exist and you think about 
realistically what would be the tension, like the source of tension. And a lot of sci-fi, you know, um, is about surviving in space and like things are falling apart or held together with duct tape, which is really grimy and all that stuff. And that just doesn't really fit with the story I'm telling because it's not a story of physical survival, it's a story of social survival and like surviving as a queer person. So, you know, the spaceship, for example, all these characters live in is like this retro futurist, like it feels like a home, okay. these lesbians that own it, like it's, <laughs> it's a home. But then I do get into like the mecha, and like the really fun, like, oh, they have like a jetpack and like rockets on their arms and stuff because that's kind of more relevant to, you know, like women repossessing their bodies or like mm -hmm. kind of that whole storyline. So the things that do come up are the things that are more relevant to, again, like surviving as a queer person. I feel like it helps to have like a metaphor also, especially for the more kind of wishy-washy like kinds of science fiction. Like for the Catherine Wright story, I it, it's called the backstitch tart of Catherine Wright. It's because I used like sewing as a metaphor for when she's trying to like go back into her own past and like re-sew things. And that kind of helped me keep it consistent despite the fact that it made no sense. <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, like having an engine that runs on memories, I assume that's part of like a thematic core of your story in a larger way. Right. It's also the engine core. It's also Sorry. the engine core. <laughs> Sorry. Because of memories. Um, yeah, like when I think about consistency in sci-fi, a big inspiration to me personally is um, in Jaime Hernandez's early work, um, there's all of the sci-fi stuff. Like Maggie is like a rocket ship mechanic and like there are like hover cars and things. And like those comics have been going for a hundred years, it feels like, probably more like 40 years. Um, and at this point, like, there's almost no sci-fi. There's like a, mm -hmm. a guy with devil horns who shows up once in a while and he's like the one holdover. And like, there's never been an attempt to explain it. Mm -hmm. It's not like, hey, where did all of this technology go? Why are we back in the, you know, mm -hmm. our old neighborhood or whatever? Why do we work in a coffee shop? Like, there's no need because like, what's important is the characters. Mm -hmm. um, on that subject, you're gonna admire this segue. <laughs> who are creators um, of queer sci-fi who have inspired your own work? And like what sci-fi, like canonically queer or not, has um, made you think differently about like the kind of work that you want to make? Can I jump in? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Which, <laughs> yeah. um, the Wachowskis are like my main kind of yeah. like source of inspiration. Um, I remember I watched The Matrix and was obsessed with it. <laughs> I was in like the <laughs> but um, that was like the Matrix was like a huge source of inspiration for me because um, it has a lot of queer things that I think I only realized later in life looking back on it. Um, the idea of like found family mm -hmm. and again um, the aspects of the world that get touched on um, that are relevant versus like, what is explained and what is not. Um, it's like this really grandiose story, but ultimately it's about like a little group of people who find each other and like have like sweaters and they're really cute and on this tiny little spaceship and then they go into this like really slick world and have to like be superheroes or whatever. Um, so that's a huge source of inspiration for me just thinking about like again worlds colliding but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Have you seen Jupiter Ascending? Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I'm going to use this public platform for a moment and say <laughs> you should all watch Jupiter Ascending. Um, Channing Tatum plays like a, a, a werewolf hover skate, yeah. like roller skate cop, oh and Dog he had himbo. angel wings, and, <laughs> but they were cut off. He's like every like you know 13 year old deviant art I see. Um, and like a big plot point is like he he's a human mixed with like the genetics of a dog and like <laughs> the female protagonist is hitting on him at one point and she's like, I love dogs, I've always loved dogs. <laughs> it's, it's a terrible, wonderful movie. Also, Eddie Redmayne plays the villain mm. and he like spends the whole time talking, talking like this. <laughs> it's great, anyway, excuse me. Um, back to the panel. I can't follow that. Um, um, I, a huge inspiration for me um, was Jeremy Cerise's graphic novel Curveball. Yeah. Um, it is, for me, like the epitome of what queer sci-fi can be. Because okay. um, he sort of does this thing where like, the rules and the parameters of this world, he will not explain them to you because you don't need to know. And you're just like inhabiting this world. Um, and because you know he's dealing in sort of like futures and potentials, like it doesn't visually, thematically, it doesn't have to be sort of grounded 
in our world and he chooses sort of where he will hearken back to something that's familiar and where he'll just kind of completely mm-hmm. like submerge you in these new technologies, these new relationships, this new thing. And it doesn't, um, you never get lost in it because the internal logic is so strong and so structured. Um, but also I think his work in general, but in that book specifically really sort of like shines uh, in a way that I think comics does very well and sci-fi can too. I mean, I think comics is an incredible medium for queer narratives because of how sort of like specific or opaque you can be in terms of like, I don't know, your characters, their bodies, their lovers, who they are, how they move through the world. You can, they can exist just as like the simple fact of what they are um, and what you see with as much or as little sort of labeling and identification as you want to give them. And Jeremy's work does that I think incredibly well and in a way that I really respond to. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, oh. If I can interrupt again, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Um, so I got to see uh, like an early copy of the new book that Jeremy <gasps> is working on. Yeah. And it is unbelievably good. Yeah. I have no idea when it's going to be released now. Um, mm-hmm. Jeremy is recovering from like a really terrible attack. Mm-hmm. But um, it is so good, and I think it surpasses Curveball, and I'm so excited for you to read it. It has like some of the greatest like high sci-fi concepts I've oh ever my read. God, Cardo, <laughs> that's so just excited. bragging. That's all I was doing, bragging. <laughs> I got to read it. It was great. Yeah, it was so good. You'll be lucky to read it when you get to. <laughs> Uh, so starting with comics, I mean, this is like a classic, but uh, Blue Delacroix's Oh Human Star, mm-hmm. I think, is, is mm-hmm. gets brought up on these panels all the time, and it's with good reason. Uh, Blue is getting toward the end of the story. It's a story that's about, you know, gay robots, ha, ha, ha. But, like, but really, <laughs> um, and it's a story about uh, family and uh, about transness and queerness and identity and, like, what makes a person... And I think it's also a similar thing with Blue's been working on this for a long time and their own understanding of themselves has changed over the course of the comic, but in a way that I think has actually worked really well and because the characters themselves are also having an evolving understanding of themselves and I think the parallel tracks of Blue as a person and the work that they're making has really enriched the work and I I can't recommend it highly enough. also, uh, the On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden, which yeah. I got mm-hmm. talked about a lot, but I didn't. I was surprised by how relatively little it got talked about as like a queer story specifically, as opposed to being like this big exciting mm-hmm. book that everybody's excited about. Because mm-hmm. it, I mean, there are queer characters in it, but also um, it's one of those kind of spaceship created family type uh, stories in a way where a lot of them do have complicated or traumatic backgrounds in a way that I think really resonates with a lot of people who have they're not hanging out with their biological family not by choice mm-hmm. um, and I and I think that the struggles that they have are very interesting and it's also a boarding school story it's doing a lot of really cool stuff uh, it, it's it's infuriating how well deserved the acclaim for that book is <laughs> um, and then in terms of prose books, um, if you haven't read Anne Leckie's uh, ancillary books, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's funny because yep. when they first came out, the whole conversation was about how, oh, well, in this like alien language, everybody's a she, but that's like really shallow. I'm like, but if you actually, like, oh, that's all the gender thing. It's just that there's no gender. They just use she for all the people. And going in, I thought that was going to be the only thing about those books, but it's actually much more complicated than that. Like Anne Leckie clearly has thought very deeply about gender mm-hmm. and the experience of gender and the experience of like, uh, how well, how that can make you feel more or less like yourself, or more or less included in different situations in a way that makes all of her books really interesting, but the ancillary books particularly. And then finally, uh, anybody who hasn't read the Wayfarer books by Becky Chambers, yeah. <laughs> they're solar punk books. They're fundamentally very hopeful. They're all very different from each other. But again, like spaceship, they have everything. They have like spaceship created family stories. They have like old lady lesbians that go on a joyride together. It has like... Um, Polyamorous yo- lizards. Yeah, polyamorous <laughs> lizards. Um, chaotic disaster bisexual teen boy. Like, it's got everything. They're just really, I just finished um, the most recent way for a book recently, and I cried a lot. Oh, and it was great. Yeah, I sobbed my entire way through, like, the last one. It's all about, um, like, creating ritual in, like, a cruel world. And that's, like, just one of the themes that just, like, hits me right there. Um, 
you know, Alison kind of went through most of like I'm so my. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. <laughs> like current influences, of, like the past ten years. Um, I do feel it's sort of necessary to point out that like I grew up in like a fairly sheltered environment um, where there just wasn't any access to queer media. Um, I grew up in Malaysia, just a country where the deputy prime minister went to prison for sodomy. Um, I mean, there were other problems. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That was probably the excuse. Um, and then I went to like private Christian school. So, uh, so my, my youth was not a youth that, was, that had queer media or queer influences or anything. So I read a shit ton of fanfic. And um, <laughs> specifically, I met Allison like 20 years ago in the Gargoyles fandom. Um, we uh, we yeah. met at the gathering yeah, of the Gargoyles. I'm 100% okay being outed on this, just yeah, to be yeah. clear. Um, but I, so a lot of my early queer influences and like queer media that I was exposed to was all fan fiction. It was like Harry Potter fan fiction and Gargoyles fan fiction and Star Trek fan fiction. And um, I think without any of that, I don't think I would have even understood or even learned about what queerness was. Mm -hmm. Or like, people are gay? What? Right. <laughs> um, so I, I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful to like fan fiction for like even opening that to me. Yeah, absolutely. Bra I'm so very, I'm sorry, very one more thing for context. Oh, no, please. Oh, I'm in my late 30s, just for, for context. <laughs> um, the only other thing I was going to say, fan fiction is such a great thing. I feel like so many people dip their toes into exploring their own queerness through fan fiction and that kind of self inserty I just really identify with this elf like kind of way. <laughs> um, and, I, and it brings me nothing but joy. Like, I love it. It's wonderful. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's good to lift stuff from fan fiction. I mean, sometimes the writing is just real. I mean, your own fan fiction. It's like sometimes the writing is super solid. Like, there's really good kissing. And, like, if it's got, like, you know, if you've got something with, like, a thousand kudos on it, it's like, obviously yeah. people like it. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I think, I think that's, like, really worth, like, mentioning is that like fan fiction is such an avenue for like underrepresented creators mm -hmm. to get their work out like to a like-minded audience mm -hmm. especially when you're younger and like yeah. the only access to community you have is virtual mm -hmm. um and like it also like helps i think younger people transform the straight media that surrounds them into something tangibly queer mm -hmm. you know like you watch star trek and then you go home and you write about Riker kissing Worf or whatever, yeah. And, yeah. and you're like, you know, you're like reshaping the media that you don't necessarily have a choice in consuming. Yeah. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense to me that like I think every time this question gets asked of like queer creators, like where do you come from? You know, like mm -hmm. what inspired you when you were younger? The answer tends to be fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't a question. That's just an observation, I guess. <laughs> um, I am thinking, um, since we still have a little bit of time left, uh, of just opening things up for questions. Um, sure. But before I do that, is there anything at this show, SPX 2019, that you would like to recommend to the people <laughs> in the audience? Um, a book you're excited about? A creator that you think they should visit? Um, I would, oh, I'm not going to know their table numbers, but you might. Um, Send Me Flowers and Mar Julia are two really, really phenomenal creators. Um, if you are interested in lusciously told queer stories, uh, they're, in my opinion, kind of some of the best that are working right now. Mm -hmm. Do you know what table they're at? They're in the I block. Okay. Um, and Mar Julia uh, was nominated for two Ignatzes this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mar Julia, I publish Mar Julia, so <laughs> I'm very excited about it. But yeah, um, Mar's book, Yellow, 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 is truly beautiful mm -hmm. um, and highly recommended. Mm -hmm. um, oh, please. I was going to say Mar as well. Mar. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple different creators. Um, there is Sam Beck. I don't know the table she's at, sorry. But um, she has this webcomic verse that's absolutely gorgeous and incredible. Um, um, definitely recommend that. And then Sarah and Natalie, uh, Natalie Reese and Sarah Getter, I think they're right by the door. They're like W. Oh, yeah, Snapshot Galaxy. Yeah, they have Snapshot <laughs> Galaxy. You need to go get it. It's amazing. It's like this queer little fun sci fi. It's just, 
goofy, great bullshit. I'm so excited. It's like, she's like, what if there was like a shitty cat girl? <laughs> and then a big, mean dragon lady. <laughs> Uh, that was one of them. Um, also, my friend Corey Michelle Handworker lost their mind and made like 10 million new zines for this show, nice. um, including reprinting some of their old scenes. They collaborated on a um, gay post-canon fan comic about Doug the Cartoon, which is inc- <laughs> incredible. It's all about like redeeming Roger Klotz. It's so good. Um, but they also like reprinted their Fuck You, I'm Trans thing. They made a zine about Smash Mouth. They made a scene about Pet Shop Boys. Corey is one of the most beautiful gay people in the world, and uh, you should support them. And also, um, my friend Carrie Peach made a zine that is basically all like gay Witcher and Zelda fan art, and you yeah. should go. <laughs> you should go get that also. Uh, Blue Dill Quanti's here. Oh okay. yeah, yeah. Should definitely pick up copies of Oh Human Star if you haven't already. Uh, my table neighbor uh, Atmaja mm-hmm. Pandya yeah. is. Uh, Got got these wonderful zine about uh, K-pop boys um, mm-hmm. that I'm super excited about. One about also Brooklyn gentrification. Um, <laughs> Phantom, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Might not be Brooklyn. It's one of the Queens. Boroughs. Queens. Yeah. There you go. Um, but yeah, good stuff. Um, Actually, the whole eye block is oh, yeah, pretty please. gay. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I have one more. Um, Emma, who's actually here. What's your table? Emma. <laughs> yes, Emma. Emma. Uh, D14. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't, don't write, uh, they lost my books. Oh no! <laughs> so it's not actually... Go say hi to Emma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Emma. Silversprocket.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, um, yeah. And I guess if I can drop... Uh, well, yes, but I also really like it. <laughs> if I can drop a couple recommendations to um, Emma Jane is here. Um, at She's like with an eye shot of my table um, on the wall next to uh, Lucy Nisley, um, who's wearing a bright yellow jumpsuit. Can't miss her. <laughs> um, but Emma Jane has uh, multiple books here. She's also nominated for two Ignatzes. Um, her book, Trans Girls Hit the Town, is not sci fi, and it's exactly what it sounds like. And then um, she has like a large graphic novel called Dream Eater, which is like fantasy sci fi about like a high school band that tries to get back together and accidentally like summons a demon. Um, it's very good. Um, and then at the Diskette Press table, which is my table, I 14. Um, I just published a book that I'm super excited about. It is a prose book. It's a collection of writing from a 22-year-old trans woman serving in the Canadian Army currently. And it is like brutal, incredible writing, some of it very well-written science fiction, highly recommended. It's called Empty Casings. Um, So with that, uh, I guess I'd like to open for questions. It looks like we have two microphones. So if you want to form lines behind them, I guess. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, if you don't want to do lines, I can like point to you and then you can walk to the microphone. Um, there's no rules. We're queer. <laughs> 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 Who has a question? You. Wonderful. Um, I was just wondering, is there any influence from like anime in any of your work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in any of the uh, previous influences? Yes. Do yeah. we just want to go down the road and say yes? Yes. Uh, where to start? Yeah, I feel like anime is like my only influence. Um, I mean, it's interesting because like there's very little qu- direct queer influence from anime for me. It's more just like aesthetic. Like, I mean, my entire book is based uh, right before the Meiji Restoration in Japan because I was obsessed with Roni Kenshin in high school and college. <laughs> I was like, this seems like a really interesting period in history. And I was originally, now, I mean, Shing's out of me, I was originally going to write this Sorry. really elaborate Roni Kenshin fanfic and did all this research for it. And like, why don't I make a comic <laughs> instead? Um, so the genesis of what is left was actually me finally finishing uh, this incredible 12 episode uh, anime series called Kaiba, which is by Masaki Yuasa. That's one of my absolute favorites. And it is, I wouldn't say, doesn't say queer on the tin, but there is a lot in that book about identity and the body and sort of like where identity is housed. And uh, it's, I mean, it's fucking incredible. I recommend it to everybody. Um, so that anime specifically, but also every other anime. Yeah, I was going to, of course, Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah, I mean, that's a big one for me, kind of mm -hmm. like a ragtag group of people coming together and like picking up random people along the way, and then like, and oh, it's Pam. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, so yeah. Also, yeah. just, yeah. I was gonna say, honestly, I've only seen like three anime in my entire life, but they've all been incredibly influential. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Cowboy Bebop, Planetus, and Kino no Tabe, Kino's Journey. You make good and, choices. And like, yeah. all three of them are basically like such fundamental, like, you know, anchors for my work. Mm -hmm. But like, generally, I don't watch that much. Oh, and sorry, I watch a lot of Evangelion also, but <laughs> God. I mean, I think for me, like my actual drawing style is not very manga influenced, but my narrative storytelling style is very manga influenced. I really like to take my time. I really like to not draw backgrounds when I don't feel like it. Um, and I, I feel like being having a lot of close-ups and really thinking about the moment-to-moment -moment acting of characters is something that I definitely picked up from reading manga uh, in my teens and 20s. Because I, at the time when I was started reading this, the American comics really still weren't doing that yet. And yeah. I feel like it's this new generation of cartoonists that are kind of more influenced by that. Mm -hmm. So it's like manga definitely influenced my uh, storytelling style a lot. Yeah, my, my paneling I feel like is completely, I owe completely to reading a lot of shoujo when I was younger, which sort of like every page is laid out in a completely different way in service of sort of how that panel structure is gonna advance the story, how it's gonna affect like time and yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? I'm looking. I mean, if other people don't have questions, I can keep asking questions, but. Oh, wait, we got one. Uh, we got one. Oh, oh, okay, you first. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I want to make sure, I may ramble on, so just say, you know, stop. If I do. <laughs> but um, my question is, for someone who does not have the perspective of a person or people who um, have to deal with a lot of stuff from the queer um, angle, uh -huh. how does one, or could you give some advice on how to go about writing or developing characters respectfully, Yeah. even though the writer themselves may not have that perspective? That's a really, can I answer this one? Please. Yeah, please. I, um, <laughs> So I think more than anything, uh, my advice to anyone who's writing characters who like, um, like, have a marginalized identity outside of your own experience is to um, ask friends that you have who are of that identity like to do a read or pay them even better <laughs> pay them to do it. Um, but like, there's always going to be things you're blind to, and like just accepting that and like doing your best and like being willing to make edits is like the best thing that I can recommend. Like I think it's important to write characters outside of your own experience. Um, and at the same time, I think it's important that like we recognize as authors that like we cannot possibly understand everything that everyone has ever gone through. And so like having the um, sense to edit and like give yourself that leeway to like change things if you need to is, is the best thing you can do as a writer. I would, not everybody agrees with me on this one, but personally I recommend that if you're writing any marginalized identity that is not your own, although I can speak as a queer person, I feel like the key, especially early on, is to not have their marginalization be the thing that is bad for them in the story. Like, and also in more generally like, Maybe if you want to write about a queer person and you are not queer, having their queerness be the entire plot of the book is usually will not work out as well. Like having a mystery novel where he's a detective and he also is gay, like that's great. Mystery novel where his whole plot is about coming out to his parents, like less, even if it goes well and his parents love him, like maybe like that's not the best thing to start with. Like maybe have it be that he just happens to be a gay man who solves mysteries. I think that sort of ties in, I mean, sort of the, the general thing in these instances um, is sort of like recognizing what stories are ours, any of us, to tell, and what stories are us sort of overstepping into shoes or trying to write experiences that we don't actually have access to. And I completely agree that, like, oh, like, absolutely include, you know, queer characters, any, any type of character, even if you are not a person that is from that identity. But I, you know, speaking from my own experience, at least, there are, there are stories that I just will never tell because they aren't my story to tell. They're characters whose perspectives I will never write from because I don't have access to that. But when I am writing stories with characters that come from sort of different uh, 
lived experiences than mine. I, I agree with Carta, where like if there are people in your life that you can turn to, but also, you know, paid like sensitivity readers or just like other people that sort of like can can bring that perspective and can sort of like, you know, get get money from it. Like yeah. get yeah. Um, Telling the stories that are yours to tell is so important, and then sensitivity readers and like your friends can help with thinking about the ways that their identity impacts the story you are telling, in a way that's not invasive or in a way that's it's only relevant to the story you are telling. Um, and that's super helpful and painful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't really have much else to add except that I am really done with stories where the queer person comes out to the straight person as a way to make the straight person seem really nice and sensitive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if I never had to read that again, I'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do an exercise that I really like whenever I like teach a comics class or whatever, where like, especially with people who don't make comics, where um, I tell them to make a four panel comic depicting the moment that I came out as trans to my parents and I don't give them any more information than that. Um, because like secretly, I'm telling all of you this, I hope it's not recorded. Um, <laughs> secretly, what that exercise is, is like make a comic about coming out to your parents. Mm -hmm. Like you, they don't realize that while they're doing it, but like the comics that you get are like very clearly like they are imagining how their own parents might respond and like the house that they draw is like a house that they recognize mm -hmm. and like, the scenario that they draw is a scenario that they have thought through. You know, like if they write about like sending an email or whatever, like that tells me a lot. Um, and so I think giving yourself um, permission to make it about you, you know, especially when it comes to queerness, if you're not queer and you're writing queer characters, like open yourself to the idea that like you are still writing about your own experiences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're still exploring like a facet of your life that is like very much within reach to you. It's not hard to be queer, right? Like it, it's not hard to make that leap, if that makes sense. Yeah. Other questions? There was someone, yeah, mm -hmm. back there. We probably have time for like two more questions, I think. Hey, so um, I'm thinking about like Sailor Moon and about like all the recent um, articles I feel like have been coming out where it's like this famous Viking warrior was a woman or you know the, the two lovers were actually both men or something like that. <laughs> and what your guys' opinion is on like explicitly stating like this is a queer story versus just kind of telling the story and mm -hmm. showing it, but knowing that sometimes people might misinterpret it um, either willfully or maybe they're a younger person or a late in life queer and they're like seeing themselves and they don't know what it is and they're like ah it's straight I'm sure it's straight <laughs> like if that makes any sense yeah absolutely I feel like it's less of an issue than it used to be because it's easier to make and distribute comics and other stories that are like no like these two men are kissing each other like you're, it's mm -hmm. Because the stuff that I was consuming when I was younger was mostly subtextual, a lot of things. And so, like, yeah, you had to, like, understand the intent behind it and, like, find that or not find that. But I find, like, at this point, it's like I just make everything very explicitly gay. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I, I, like, sometimes forget that my book is queer, but every character is a lesbian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but it's an interesting balance, because obviously I don't want, I don't want to, like, drive that home about being gay, like, I, it is, but um, it just kind of, like, the core of the story is based around that, but at the same time, I think we're still kind of in this weird middle place where you do have to say it, and you do have to be clear about it, because it also has value to like, your readers and the people who are reading it who want to see themselves represented, um, and there is a lot of value, too, in referencing it and putting it on the page rather than just when you talk about the book, like if there mm -hmm. are signifiers in your book, it also makes it, there's something about like canon content that's still really significant to the queer community, I feel like, mm -hmm. I'm still in that place where I need to see it, like not just yeah. in the subtext, but I need to see like really explicitly this is queer. 
the whole I, Dumbledore is gay thing. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's important to to show like queerness and not just assert queerness mm -hmm. because it's not enough to say like Dumbledore is gay, you know, like off screen. And it's also not enough, you know, I think a big problem that happens with like especially more corporate um, storytelling is like that thing with the, the most recent Avengers movie where like the director of that movie who was a straight man like shows up in the movie to play a gay character for mm -hmm. five seconds and he's like, my husband. And like <laughs> that was supposed to be like the big victory for gay people um, <laughs> because they were mentioned in the presence of Captain America. Um, <laughs> And like, I, I think it's really important to, to just do it, you know, like it, it's, it's more important to do the thing and let other people come to their own conclusions than it is to say like, this is a gay story. Um, because I think like a lot of subtextual things still have an extremely powerful queer energy. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like early Wonder Woman comics, there's nothing in there saying like, well, she's gay, this is all gay, but like, all the pretty ladies are tying each other up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you don't need you don't need like the sign on it that's like gay. You know, like it's it's clear and it it comes across clearly. I think my favorite thing to do at this point is to do stuff that starts that way and then they do actually mm. kiss each other in the end. <laughs> I like to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. Like surprise people with it. Oh yes, no, they're tying each other up for a reason. Yeah. That reason is that they're lesbians. <laughs> I do think it's fairly important, like, I mean, I'd spent so much of my life kind of being like, am I gay? That, like, for me, it is really important to write, like, very questioning characters. Mm -hmm. um, because, and, and it, I feel, I definitely feel better about a lot of subtext, especially since there is so much media now that is like, yup, this is gay as hell. Um, <laughs> so, like, I'm, I'm writing a historical fiction book. And it's very much about a girl falling in love with her best friend, and she doesn't have the language to explain what she's feeling. But that is like such a you know it's such a baby lesbian um, story mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I, I did feel it necessary to be to be really like clear that yes she is very gay and mm -hmm. she is staring at her friend with like moony eyes all yeah. the time. But it is not a reciprocated yeah. like thing mm -hmm. because it is a that also is a really common story. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, very much feel like all of our sort of early experiences mm -hmm. with contending with our own queerness yeah. very much now come across in how we like to see it depicted because I, I had sort of the, the privilege of growing up in a household. I like my dad is married to a man, like they've been together forever. I grew up where like most of our family friends were queer. Most of the people in my life were queer. Coming out was a very different experience for me. It was almost a non-experience for me, which is not the norm. Um, but I feel like that sort of is, I've kind of imbued my work with that approach where it's just not a question. Like it just is the way the world is and the way the world has always been. And it is, I've had the experience where other people don't sort of read that yeah. at first in my work. Like I've had, it, it was interesting, what is left has been reviewed by straight men and not by straight men. And the differences <laughs> in the reviews is that they talk about the relationship between Isla and Kello in sort of very different ways as just like this, you know, this woman sort of like forms this obsession or like is thinking about this or like has this thing and uh, the reviews by, by women and, and queer women are like, she's falling in love, like we're watching someone fall in love, um, which is what it's intended to be and what I always thought of it to be. So it's always an interesting thing to sort of see the way people pick up or don't pick up what it is that you're putting down, I don't know. Did yeah. you really get know. like space gal pals reviews? Uh, yeah. Kind of, yeah, like people that would talk about sort of like this, uh, yeah, that approach it in like a very clinical way as sort of like she's observing this other person's life and you can feel them starting to form <laughs> a connection and it's like, no, she she loves her. She loves her. <laughs> well, um, that, is, that is the panel. We did the panel. Um, Thank, thank you. you all for coming. <laughs>